This program is brought to you by Freedom From Fear, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping people who suffer from anxieties and depression. Remember back in high school, that quiet kid in the class who never raised his hand? There's always um, outsiders in every high school, but I mean, I, was, I felt like I was on the outside of the outsiders. And how about that coworker of yours who hardly speaks at meetings? If they ask my opinion on something, I just, oof, you know, I get very frightened. We've all known people like this before, and we've all suffered through our own share of shyness. Do you brush your teeth every day? But for some people, shyness goes way beyond what you could ever imagine. This documentary will take you on a journey into the world of people who suffer from social anxiety disorder. The third most common mental disorder in our country after depression and substance abuse. What does it feel like to suffer from this disorder? It's a feeling of terror like a life and death situation. How does it affect families? It's a chemical situation that has affected just about all 11 aunts and uncles of mine, and it's now come down to second and third generations. What causes it? We've recognized the disorder. We've described it. We understand something about the biology, a lot about how common it is in the population. And how can you get help? If somebody does have social anxiety disorder, they should know that there is very effective treatment and treatment that's very safe and well tolerated. I want to be confident. I want to be outgoing. I want to have a lot of friends. I, I, I'd like to move up in my career. I really think I have a lot to offer. I just have to get past this awful fear. One of the things that strikes me is that there's all this lost potential in a group of people who tend to be our most sensitive and often our most caring. So it's like those are the people we need to get out. <laughs> coffee but I'm already getting nervous um, I procrastinate I spend a lot of time doing stuff around the house I know I have to be there but I try to prolong being home in my little comfort zone as, as long as I can as I'm driving to work I can feel the anxiety building my stomach starts to get sick and I start to sweat by the time I get into work driving up that driveway I'm pretty much a mess Going up the stairs, walking down the hall, I'm just dreading every moment of the day. Social anxiety disorder is one of six main kinds of anxiety disorder that we now recognize in psychiatry and psychology. It's actually the most common. It's also known as social phobia. Social anxiety disorder affects millions of people worldwide. It causes someone like Pam to feel intense anxiety in almost any social situation. If I get one wrong look from someone, I'm immediately going to think that I'm an absolute idiot and we're going to have to leave. People with social anxiety disorder become very overly sensitive about what other people are thinking about them. Interestingly, they'll often come in the office and say, I'm paranoid, but they're not paranoid at all. What it is is they have tremendous interpersonal sensitivity. So every time they're around other people, they think that people are judging them because they think they're actually doing bad. Looking stupid, looking incompetent, being inarticulate, having people criticize them, even if it's not verbalized. The idea that people are judging you and criticizing you potentially or negatively evaluating you is a, is a huge fear for these people. There's a range of severity. So people with, who have it to a more moderate degree can function but with enormous effort and pain. They maybe can work, but they'll do something that's below their capabilities because rather than have to interact a lot with other people. It's very hard to have friends. It's very hard to form an intimate relationship. It's very hard to socialize. For some people, the disorder manifests itself only in performance situations. But for others, it permeates every aspect of their lives. In the extreme, people become extremely isolated. They don't work. They end up on disability or being supported by their families. 
They'll be afraid to use public restrooms. They become afraid to eat in restaurants because they're afraid people may be watching them and they may spill their food or choke. Uh, we've seen people who are afraid to endorse a check in front of the teller because while the teller is watching, their hand starts to shake. Well, the, the checkout line is the worst, of course. And, and then um, other than that, you know, first going into the store, it, it's like, um, I know it's not happening, but it's like all eyes and turn to see who's coming in. And, you know, and then walking around and then looking at stuff, you know, it's, it's like, um, I always feel like I'm, you know, under a spotlight. James lives at home with his parents and hasn't worked in four years. Just being out of his house for longer than an hour is sometimes more than James can bear. Social anxiety disorder has taken over his life. I felt a lot of times like just like a freak, you know, just because, just because of this. I mean, I mean, how how can you how can you be a, be so I mean, actually afraid of other people? I mean, it doesn't. I've never heard of that. We've all experienced moments of shyness, but suffering from social anxiety disorder and being shy are two very different things. Shy people may be uncomfortable or not like doing certain things, but they're able to do them. Whereas the people with social anxiety disorder get these actual panic attacks and really cannot do these things. While socially anxious people are often limited by their disorder, shy people play an important role in society. Our society rewards with a great deal of dignity and economic reward those who like to work alone, like computer programmers, scientists, poets, writers. T.S. Eliot was a very shy child and a very shy adult, and so he closed the door and wrote poetry and plays and won a Nobel Prize in literature. It's only a problem when it's over the top, okay? when it incapacitates us, when it keeps us from getting to do the things that we want to do in life, when it robs us of pleasure, when it keeps us from working, when it keeps us from having relationships. It's a problem. The worst time for me was was in a, a particular meeting where I was having the panic attack and um, I just I still can remember the feeling of just being frozen. Um, I didn't want to turn my head at all. Um, you know, I was afraid to look at anybody on the side of me. Um, just just sweating and just having this feeling of, of being outside my body, kind of looking down on me. feeling of terror like a life and death situation basically and it's totally unrealistic um, but that's that's how I feel inside Chris is a computer programmer he started a social anxiety disorder website to help others who are going through struggles similar to his own right after years of battling with social anxiety Chris considers himself 90% better I feel that I've overcome a lot of the disorder and I want to show other people that that they can do the same. I've come a long way from where I was in the past, uh, and I'm a lot, I'm able to handle it. I'm not 100% cured, but I'm able to handle it a lot better. Barb knows social anxiety as a psychologist and as a patient. She lectures on the importance of self-acceptance in overcoming anxiety as she struggles to find that acceptance within herself. I'm a psychologist. I should be able to have myself more together. Um, just feeling like that somehow that's not cool, you know. That, but you know, I'm sure doctors get sick and have to go to doctors and get antibiotics. So why wouldn't psychologists have mental health problems too? One of the hardest things for someone with social anxiety to do is get up in front of an audience. Today. Barbara is doing just that, giving a presentation on social anxiety disorder for the general public. The anticipation of giving a speech is really the worst for me. Sometimes I'm a little bit reluctant and, uh, you know, sometimes get angry or frustrated, like, you know, why do I have to do this? But I don't really have to. I'm choosing to. And, Part of it is, is growth, that's okay. why Good. I keep doing it. Today's presentation is about people who are painfully shy. It's also known as social anxiety disorder or social phobia, but this presentation is more 
than just about social anxiety disorder. It's about courage. I'm going to try something that I haven't done before. I'm going to try uh, to share some of my own experiences, but it's going to be hard. It's not like I go around and tell everybody that, oh, I have this problem with anxiety and, you know, I don't do that. I did well in school academically, but I never said a word. I always sat in the back of the class, hoping the teacher wouldn't call on me. If there was ever the slightest hint that class participation would be involved that day, I felt like I was literally going to die. If there's anything I hope I can pass on to my son is the important lesson I've learned. It's good to take risks, unless you take the risk to break out of your comfort zone, to try new things, your world stays small, and you never know what joy you might be missing. Thank you very much. When I'm done and it's over, a lot of times I just feel this huge relief. But also, there's been times where I feel so emotional, like I want to cry, because it's just like, I think I've built so much into it, and it's just been so draining that, you know, I just kind of, I don't know, it just all. What do you feel? I don't know, I'm just sad. <laughs> I guess just talking about all the painful times, I don't know. I'm just wondering if I did the right thing to do that. It's so much easier just to stay and be the professional. <sighs> I Over the last two decades, experts have explored what causes this disorder. We certainly know that it runs in families, so that people who have first-degree relatives, parents, for example, who have the illness, are more likely to get it than other people. But that only explains a part of the reason people get it. Many people have a situation where maybe they were humiliated, criticized, rejected, uh, evaluated poorly socially, and then they felt a loss of control, and they felt embarrassed, and there was a lot of shame that they experienced in that moment. And then what happens is they became more and more fearful of those situations. And so more avoidance took place or just negative uh, perceptions of situations like this. And so they started to then um, develop almost like a conditioned response to their fear. Of all the adults or adolescents that a psychiatrist would say have social anxiety or social phobia, some acquired it. They didn't have any special temperamental or genetic bias, but some did. The temperamental bias, which is inherited, is not for shyness. What you inherit is a tendency to overreact to anything that's new, novel, unfamiliar. We know that a particular circuitry in the brain uh, of animals is reliably triggered when those animals experience fear in particular laboratory uh, situations, something called conditioned fear. And it specifically involves a brain structure called the amygdala, which is kind of the central part of the brain for fear responses. This structure always fires when anything new happens. You hear a sound you didn't expect, you see a sight you didn't expect, a smell you didn't expect. And we think that the children who are born with this bias to overreact to novelty inherit a neurochemistry that makes this structure, the amygdala, very excitable. In a groundbreaking study, Dr. Jerome Kagan of Harvard University videotaped the reactions of infants to unfamiliar stimuli. His research suggests that some infants have a temperamental bias to experience anxiety. If you were an infant with such a chemistry, then if we showed those infants interesting stimuli they never saw before, like mobiles, colorful dolls that were moved in front of their face, that if you had this chemistry, 
you would begin to show this motor vigor and begin to cry because we had passed your threshold. That is a sign that you have inherited a chemistry in the amygdala that has rendered it very excitable. Therefore, for the rest of your life, you should be biased to react to unfamiliar things with an initial restraint. Kayla, what did you learn yesterday? Did you have your picture in your desk? Is your picture in your desk? Can you share it with us? Kayla is seven. She suffers from a disorder called selective mutism, which is a form of social anxiety disorder. There are some children that just manifest social phobia this way. They just literally shut down. And they do it with their voice because that's their easiest way of not communicating, not interacting. They find that, and over time, they learn, that's like a learned behavior. So they shut down and they don't speak, so no attention will be brought to them. Do you brush your teeth every day? Yes or no? Do you brush them every day? Yes? Are you shaking your head, Jess? I didn't hear it rattle. Shall I come back to you? OK, I'll come back to you. These children want so desperately to talk, and they can't. The words just don't come out. They can't speak. It's stuck. I've had little kids tell me that they're stuck in their throat. They're stuck in their chest. Their tongue's playing tricks on them. Their lips won't open up right. Their it's mouth just doesn't together. work. Their brain is telling them no. not to talk. Um, who did, Fred, who's your neighbor? When I watch my daughter in the classroom, um, it's very painful to see her struggle and not be able to interact with the other children like, like they do. And it um, just breaks my heart. But before Kayla was diagnosed, Sherry was filled with frustration and anger. I can remember yelling at her, saying, you know, why are you doing this? You know, quit embarrassing me. And I really thought that it was some kind of control, that she was doing this almost on purpose. I mean, this child was suffering from major anxiety, and I just didn't understand. It's often difficult for parents to tell that these children have social phobia or selective mutism. Reason being because at home they're comfortable and they're totally fine. And I go first. They're often bossy. They're stubborn. They're, um, ass they're very assertive. You got that one. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> got you. Give me one color. I am I. Sherry has suffered from anxiety for many years, but she didn't associate her feelings of fear with Kayla's behavior. And then one day, she had to give a speech to a classroom full of her peers, and reality hit. The fear that took over my body, I mean, I was literally feeling sick, I was sweating, I was... And that's when it brought so much light to me. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what my daughter is feeling every single day close to you. Next In the majority of cases, this anxiety is hereditary. It's passed on from one family member to the next. So when these parents find out that the symptoms that these children have are due to anxiety, it makes them take a step back and realize, this is me. This was my brother. This was my sister. All of these things that my child is going through is what I went through and what I'm feeling. It's just been a real eye-opener for me. I've learned so, so much about myself. It helps me to understand myself better. And mostly it helps me to understand Kayla. This is me on the map of my room. Natalie is Kayla's best friend in school. I cherish their friendship because Kayla has come so, so far this year. And a lot of their credit goes to Natalie and to her teacher, Mrs. Decker. Marcy <laughs> keeps saying this note. These children tend to bond with very outgoing children because they will do the speaking for them. And that's what you see with Kayla. You see Kayla having bonded with Natalie. Well, when she's shy to talk, she just tells me and she whispers it to me and I say it for her. What? And I made her talk because the first she was reading to me and I keep telling her that she could do it. Kayla's come a long way. She's got good friends in school, and she speaks with Natalie. 
But in order for her to fully recover, Dr. Blum has suggested that she take antidepressant medication. We should start them on very low doses of medication in order to lower their anxiety level. The children are much more receptive when their anxiety is lower. They're able to perform the things that we need them to do. Once Kayla becomes more confident and comfortable in the classroom, she will be slowly taken off her medication. <laughs> the prognosis of selective mutism, when it's viewed from an anxiety perspective, is excellent. These children overcome selective mutism. So if we can give them the coping skills and develop behavioral techniques to be able to deal with a stressful situation, they're able to carry that over into their life as they get older. Now I try to look at things in such a positive way, and I know that you know, we recognize the problem and that we're getting help for her, and she's going to overcome this at a young age. And she won't hopefully have to go through the pain all these years that other people do. Kayla is fortunate. She's growing up in a time when many doctors and families are recognizing this disorder in children. But for socially anxious adults like Chris, the diagnosis took years. Chris is visiting his parents' home for the first time since he has started treatment for social anxiety disorder. The conversation brings up painful memories of a lonely child, as documented by his mother, Audrey, in her diary. But I, I can see going through this, there is a number of times when I do mention shy, and I mean even one particular place where I'm actually concerned about Chris's personality. He didn't want to leave the yard all last summer. Um, he wouldn't talk or even look at others. He wouldn't go to the neighbors' houses and had trouble with Sunday school and library school. Yeah, I mean, I know there were some problems because I did, didn't feel comfortable. I remember I'd go down to the bus stop and everybody would sit on one side of the street and for some reason I would stay alone on the other side by myself, so. There's another aspect in our family. I have cousins that uh, have social anxiety situations, but I have lots of aunts that have had phobias. Grandma couldn't walk around the block unless you and Corey were with her because her, her legs would be like rubber. Um, Aunt B couldn't go on a bus. Uh, they all had heart palpitations, anxiety attacks. It's a chemical situation that has affected just about all 11 aunts and uncles of mine, and it's now come down to second and third generations. Very heart rendering to think that you were experiencing these things, and, and I was, would have loved to try to help you with it. Social anxiety affects more than the people who suffer from it. It also has an impact on everyone who loves and cares for them. So do you think you've gotten everything you want to get for your mother for Christmas? I feel at times so sad that she has so much capability, so much intelligence, beautiful woman, uh, you know, has everything in the world going for her, but she can't recognize it. I think at the party, that's extremely painful for me to watch. It's somebody I, that I care so deeply about. You know, when she thinks, okay, um, I'm ugly, I seem unprofessional, all of these thoughts, my first reaction is to just say, you're crazy. I think it's hard because I've always seen so much more in her than she sees in herself. I didn't know I had social anxiety disorder and I, they didn't have a word for it back then anyways. I mean, I was pretty depressed, not very happy. See, I feel bad for even my parents watching this. I cried myself to sleep a lot. But I don't know if I want them to know that. <laughs> I was suicidal, you know, a lot, and they didn't necessarily know that, but... I mean, I think I have it in, over in my high school yearbook that I wrote some letter in there, I think maybe I've hidden it, that, uh, that I would kill myself at a certain point if things didn't get better. In high school, I didn't have too many friends. I was a lot smaller than some of the other kids. I kind of got picked on a lot, beat up a lot. 
it's especially tough dealing with this disorder, I, I believe, being, being a guy, because we don't want to show our weaknesses and um, with the social anxiety, being shy and reserved, that's a weakness. No worry, just relax and have fun. You're perfectly safe. So I try to compensate in other areas uh, by doing things like skydiving, uh, getting involved in sports, bungee jumping. But I think I did a lot of crazy things to try to show my manliness, I guess. There's always um, outsiders in every high school, but I mean, I was, I felt like I was on the outside of the outsiders because I was just completely alone but with um, everything I was going through and everything I went through. And it, and it was tough to just seeing that other people having um, at least some one friend, you know, just to, you know, get through it all with. And I didn't, I didn't fit in with the other kids and all that, so it I mean, a lot of bad experiences just getting through high school. Just, When we went looking at colleges, I picked the easiest thing I possibly could, the closest thing I possibly could, when, you know, at that time in my life, I should have been looking for something challenging and exciting. And I went to secretarial school. It was the easiest thing I could think of. I knew how to type. I knew how to do all that stuff. I wouldn't be threatened. I wouldn't be challenged. And it would be easy. I further progressed in college. I would miss my classes. I would. I sleep on the couch all day, um, just a lot of depression. I drank a lot. Um, if I drink, then it eliminates some of the anxiety, feel a little more comfortable talking to people. One study showed the median age of uh, onset of social anxiety disorder was age 13. That means that there were a lot of shy, anxious, socially inhibited children who were probably labeled by their teachers as model students because they're not disruptive, they don't disturb anybody, they're quiet. And it's probably not recognized that these children are terrified to raise their hand, having a lot of trouble making friends because they get nervous in these social situations. And these children have a very, very high risk to grow up, to continue to have these problems, to develop depression, and also to develop substance abuse problems because a large number of people with social anxiety disorder realize, unfortunately, that alcohol is one way to calm you down in a social situation. So we really want people to pay attention to this, even in school-aged children. For socially anxious children like Pam, Chris, James, and Barbara, there was no diagnosis and no treatment. Constant anxiety caused them to develop other disorders like depression. And the way to deal with acute shyness, they were told, was to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Get over it. Snap out of it. I don't think that really works, but that's our attitude toward people with mental health problems, behavioral problems, and emotional problems. So that I think that people tend to think, well, this is just the way I am, and I'm going to get laughed at if I try to get help for it. I went to visit my friend in western New York, and she had one TV channel on her TV. And all of a sudden, this commercial came on for a social anxiety series of tapes that was supposed to help you get past this social anxiety. And they started listing the symptoms. Yeah, I said, oh my god, that's me. That's me on that tape. I started to cry, because <laughs> it just, there was a name for it. <laughs> So many years. <laughs> there was a name for it, and something existed. And it looked like I could get help. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Social anxiety disorder was misunderstood for years until 1985 when Dr. Michael Leibowitz published a paper about its devastating effects. Dr. Leibowitz started the first anxiety disorders clinic in the United States. In the last 15 years, we've recognized the disorder. We've described it. We understand something about the biology, a lot about how common it is in the population. Uh, we can really help most of the people affected by it to a significant degree. At the New York State Psychiatric Institute, 
a research team is looking into the brain in a whole new way. Utilizing PET scan imaging, they search for the answer to a puzzling question. How do the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin affect patients with social anxiety disorder? Neurotransmitters are chemicals that help pass a nerve signal from one neuron to the next. How do they affect us? Well, when you wake up in the morning, it's because certain nerves are flooding your brain with the neurotransmitter serotonin. Or when you're exercising, your nerve endings release dopamine, a neurotransmitter that helps muscles move more easily. Neurotransmitters affect everything we do, every thought we have, and they have a great influence on our sense of well-being. Think of a neurotransmitter as an electronic messenger that passes a nerve signal from one neuron to the next throughout the entire body. In order to do its job, it has to move through a small gap between neurons called the synapse and get absorbed by the next neuron. But sometimes, for reasons scientists don't yet understand, that doesn't happen. And when it doesn't, people experience a myriad of problems including the effects of social anxiety disorder. The reason that really I'm focusing now on serotonin is due to the success of the serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and those are drugs which are all currently being used in the treatment of social phobia. Dr. Kent uses PET scan images in the hope that she can see how the group of antidepressant medications, known as the SSRIs, help neurons absorb serotonin. She starts by doing a baseline PET scan on patients prior to treatment with the SSRI drug paroxetine. In the second column here, we see the baseline PET scan, or the first PET scan that was done before treatment was instituted. And the hot areas, or the brightest areas here, are the areas of the greatest binding, or greatest density of the serotonin transporter. After three to six months of treatment with paroxetine on rescanning these patients, these images show a significant reduction in hot, hot spots or brightness, indicating that those sites now are occupied by the drug, paroxetine. It does suggest that, at least with this drug, that there is very, very high occupancy of those brain sites. And so you can really see the mechanism of action of how this drug is working in the brain. All the patients really were feeling significantly better and actually functioning better in their social lives and uh, really overall um, much, much, much less anxious. Social anxiety disorder shows some difference in symptoms around the world. Dr. Roberto Luis Fernandez studies the impact of social anxiety disorder on different cultural groups. And he's found some surprising distinctions. In some Asian groups, for example, the concern is much more about the impact of your symptoms on somebody else, how they feel embarrassed or uncomfortable by you. Whereas here in the United States, it's often about feeling embarrassed yourself. Cultural differences influence how we view social anxiety disorder. They also influence what triggers it. In U.S. Latinos or Latin Americans in general, dancing is very important. And a lot of people I see come in because they're concerned about feeling embarrassed about the way they dance in front of other people. For new immigrants, social anxiety can be triggered as a reaction to a foreign environment. People who migrate um, might have been in their countries of origin somewhat shy, but not to the degree where it would have caused a problem. But after migration, they might feel much more difficulty in social interactions because they have to deal with following a new set of social rules, which they may not completely know about or feel comfortable with. Whereas if they had uh, not been in that migrant situation, they may never have had social phobia to that degree or even have received the diagnosis. There are two kinds of treatment that have been proven by good, rigorous scientific studies to be effective. One is a type of psychotherapy called cognitive behavioral psychotherapy, and the other are medications, particularly medications that we 
usually call antidepressant medications, although we now know that they're useful for anxiety as well. The medications maybe have a little bit of edge in terms of how potent they are, but the cognitive therapy looks more durable in terms of its effects after you stop. Um, so there may be ways to combine the two to really get the best of both worlds. Medication and psychotherapy are intended to change the person, and the person is part biology, part psychology. Dr. Richard Heinberg, director of the Adult Anxiety Disorder Clinic at Temple University, uses cognitive behavioral therapy with socially anxious adults. In this form of therapy, patients learn to change the way they feel by changing the way they think. She won't go out with me. She'll have changed her mind by the time I call her. Okay, Those very, very negative predictions. Right. And the outcome in truth was, <laughs> she went with me. <laughs> Pretty amazing how different those things can be, isn't it? And this therapy assumes that part of the anxiety response in adults affected by this disorder is a learned behavior. Um, and like many other learned behaviors, it can be modified through training. A very important piece of cognitive behavior therapy is not only talking about situations, but actually doing and learning by doing. Is she somebody that you would like to call again? Definitely. Okay. Well, how about we set that up okay. as our, an agreement between us that, that, that you'll call her this week? Sometime <laughs> in the next day or two, in fact, let's say, because you don't want too much time to pay. <laughs> okay, I guess. Will you agree to do that? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. Will you agree to do it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Over time, Patients learn to replace their negative, anxious response to social situations with a more appropriate one. The first step in getting better is often the hardest, finding the courage to ask for help. At least now I, 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 want, I want to do, do these things, you know, to, to reduce the anxiety. Absolutely. I think you're on the road to recovery, you know. Not only that, but just coming here. Yeah. And doing what you're doing is very courageous. <laughs> and desperation. <laughs> uh, you could call it desperation. Yeah. Um, what do you feel better, calling it desperation or courage? What's going to make you feel better? They're both correct. <laughs> well, well, I guess whatever people want to call it. Yeah, what it do you feel, to me, it feels desperate, though. It right? feels desperate. Yeah. It's, but if you said it courageous, say courageous. Courageous. Say desperate. Desperate. Which feels better? Well, not what feels more real. What feels better? Um, courageous feels better for me. It's a better thing. You know, it's so uh, that okay. feels you know, better. But it feels desperate. Yeah. Where you need to go in your thinking is to start balancing that negative thinking that it's desperate. Yeah. To one of courageous. They're both correct. Yeah. But the other way is going to wow. make you happier. I see. I never thought of it that way before, that they're both correct. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, to me, it just seemed desperate, and that was it. Right. Uh, well, think about it as courageous. Okay. Okay? Just two months after beginning cognitive behavioral therapy, James starts seeing results. Today I'm going to the to a grocery store because um, that is something that has been hard for me to do in the past. I feel I have made some progress, you know, in dealing with social phobia. Just on like trying to face the things I used to avoid before. I've been using a lot of techniques on that, that I learned from the therapist I'm seeing, uh, Dr. Caden. One of the ones that helps me a lot is just to um, remind myself, you know, even if I do feel anxious and, um, you know, it, it, even if it is noticed by other people or that it's, it's not the end of the world and, you know, I just think, so what, you know, even if they do see that, you know, about me. No, it's cash. Thanks. You too. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I'm learning that about a lot of things lately. You know, nothing is as bad as it seems it could be. 
Another way James copes with his anxiety is by using a talent he's had for years, turning his experiences with social anxiety into cartoons. I guess it's like with, with um, writing, they say, write what you know, and it's like, this is something I knew what it was like to go through, so I might as well do cartoons on, on that, you know. I can appreciate, you know, how awful a certain experience can be, but then find the humor in it and it put it into a cartoon. A couple of websites that also deal with this um, have put them up, I've gotten a lot of good feedback. It's good just to look at the bad experiences and, and you know, make funny cartoons out of them. And if other people can look at them and maybe laugh too, then all the better. There. After years of living with anxiety, Pam has also decided to fight the fear. It's been about four weeks, I'd say, since you guys were last here. And I've started taking a medication, continue to see the social worker who's helping me with cognitive therapy. And I've had some ups and downs. Today, Pam is going to the hairdresser, an activity most women look forward to. But for Pam, it has been filled with fear. I've been going to the hairdresser in Boston for probably 12 years, and I'm still scared to go in and talk to this man. The day before I go, I try to think of interesting things to talk about, so that when I go in and start talking to him, I feel like I have something interesting to say. And the day of the event, I'm a basket case. And it's nothing this man has done. For some reason, he makes me nervous. As Pam and her boyfriend Mike approach Boston, she waits for the inevitable hit of anxiety to take over her day. Now this is interesting. Usually by this time I like to start shaking. Is at this like point a on the highway. Time in the drive? Well, yeah, because as we get closer to the city, I start getting nervous. Are you nervous yet? Well, a little, but not like usual. I think I'm getting better. <laughs> Usually when we get to this point on the bridge, my heart would start pounding and start breathing really quickly, and my legs feel like absolute jelly. Really? Yeah. And it's not happening now? No, it's oh, not. that's cool. I mean, I'm a little nervous, but not, but not you know. Good. Her hairdresser Alan have talked and laughed during their appointments for years. In all that time, Pam never let on that inside she was filled with anxiety. But today, their banter is surprisingly comfortable, and her laughter is real. It oh, feels great because I love to come in here. <laughs> she loves it. This is the first time actually in about 12 years since I started coming to the salon that I've actually really enjoyed being with him as opposed to thinking of myself being nervous. It's a great feeling. A lot of people would never allow themselves to be filmed while in their, in their mind they look the worst that they can possibly look. But Pam's so comfortable with herself. <laughs> you might be surprised about that. <laughs> if I can let myself be interviewed getting my hair done like this, I think I can do anything. Oh, I love the color. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, how would you feel? I felt pretty good, actually. I didn't feel as nervous. And they filmed everything, like the hair color. <laughs> we don't embarrass. No, but not really. I think it must be the medication must be starting to kick in or something. <clears throat> Two months later, Pam's feeling even better. I'm doing much better since the last time I saw you. I feel like I have a sense of my confidence back. 
Um, I'm able to talk to people now where I couldn't before. Going to a party at one point would really make me very nervous and I would cancel more likely than go to the party. I'm much better with that. I can talk to people, even strangers. Yeah, I get up early. I do get up early. I, I have a long way to go and I have my ups and downs. There are weeks when I feel myself getting back into that spiral again, oh you're bad, bad, bad. But you just pull yourself out, get your medication, go to the therapist and it, it, you just feel much better. <laughs> you can be friends with people, you can be social. You don't have to hide in your house or hide from social activities or hide from work. There, there is a way to get past this. <laughs> it's liberating. It's been almost a year since Kayla started taking medication for her selective mutism. Kayla started on medication shortly after we were here, and the medication has helped her tremendously. At home here, she became much more adventurous. Going to the top. She would climb trees, hang upside down or swing sets, and just became like a little monkey, <laughs> which was something we didn't, we never really saw in our child before. We didn't realize how truly inhibited she was just in everyday life before she started on the medication. I mean, it's just amazing to see what she can do now versus what she couldn't before. But the biggest change in Kayla comes out at school. Okay, hold them, hold them. Me, okay. me and Abby will give them to you. Okay, and then we do it, we do it. In the classroom, Kayla has just really become a different child. Her body language is so different. She's seems so completely more relaxed than she ever has been ever in the last few years of school. <laughs> she interacts so much more with the kids and, you know, speaks with them now in small groups, doesn't have to whisper. Are you done? No. <laughs> so good. Although Kayla's come a long way in a year, there's still some areas that she needs to continue working on. Where can we find Jumbo Burger? Like interacting with her teacher. Kayla, do you want to point to the Jumbo Burger? Sometimes she'll just nod yes and no. Which is it? Um, sometimes she'll say something, but it's usually just one or two sentences. And then other times she won't say anything and she'll whisper in a, her friend's ear. And her friend will tell me, you know, the answer. Christmas morning, Clara runs to her stocking. Okay. To help Kayla feel more comfortable with her teacher, her parents make tapes of Kayla reading at home that she shares with her teacher after school. On Christmas Eve, Clara looks out her window. She makes a wish. By doing this, they hope to eventually ease Kayla into speaking with her teacher during class. Hopefully by next year we can get her talking out loud to the teacher and participating in class verbally in front of everybody, we'd, uh, we'd be extremely happy. And uh, I think that's realistic. Whether it happens in a year or not, I don't know, but uh, she's certainly on her way there. Kayla is always going to have um, a shy disposition about her. She's never going to be able to walk into a classroom and yell, hey, I'm here. But just to have her being able to, to interact and speak freely with with everybody, really, would just be a, a great accomplishment for her. And if she can't do it, you know what? We'll still love her the same. I found out about five years ago, I don't know, I was about uh, 27, when I first found out there was a name behind it. I uh, just was shopping in the bookstore and, and found a book called The Anxiety and Phobia Workbook, and it described my symptoms exactly. And then I started practicing some of the things that they recommended, uh, learning what was happening to my body, learning how to control those bodily symptoms, and then also uh, dealing with some of the mental thoughts that were going through my head and, and contradicting those thoughts. Once Chris started combining medication with his therapy, he began to notice a change. I didn't see any results for about six weeks. But um, after six weeks, all of a sudden, I had this big meeting, and it was with um, the top two people in the company. Now, I never, 
I never have a meeting with those two. So it was like, what do these guys want? And um, so I go to the meeting and I, I just couldn't believe, I mean, I did not feel nervous at all. At that point, that's where I knew that the medication was working for me. And I've been on it for about a year now. And I'm hoping in another six, within the next six months, I'm going to try to slowly get myself off of it and try to pick up on some of the therapy a little bit more. For many socially anxious people, like Chris, getting better means knocking down the walls of loneliness around them. When I first decided to ask Shirley to marry me, I wanted to do something different, something original. I was talking to my sister and she thought it might be neat if I, if I made a big sign um, on the building across from uh, my apartment. So I, th I thought, oh, that's a great idea. So I ended up making this big sign. I think it was about 30 feet. I went over to the building across the street from where my apartment was at. I went up there and started putting the sign together. And I had my, my sister and uh, her husband across the, the way in my apartment. They were filming me and, and telling me if the if the sign was you know, it wasn't crooked, make sure it was straight. Oh God, Chris! They were scared I was going to fall off the edge. Oh, this is so scary. Finally, I got it out there. Went and picked up Shirley, brought her over to my apartment. I pointed out the sign, and she was like, "Oh, that's that's not for me, is it?" And then I got down on my knee and and asked her. She said yes. Looking back, I, I never thought I would, would have the opportunity uh, to get married or, or find a relationship like this. Um, just feels really good to, to be able to, to overcome this and, and get to this point. I've come a long ways. It's kind of a, you know, just a little bit, a day-to-day -day progression. There's going to be ups and downs. There's going to be times where you feel like, wow, I'm making great progress. But then there's also times where you have setbacks and you feel like withdrawing again. For me, that's been important to realize that, okay, it's not just a total, you know, linear progression upwards in terms of recovery. And the fact that I still struggle with it, I don't think in any way negates the progress that I've made or the progress that is possible that I still may make in the future. While there's no cure for social anxiety disorder, treatment can make a difference. What does that mean? They'll still have anxiety. They may still have more anxiety than, you know, Joe Schmo next door who doesn't have a problem with social anxiety. But they have a very good chance of starting in a positive way along the road to doing those things that they haven't been doing, to doing it with a great deal less anxiety than they started with. And that's a huge step forward. As Barb continues to get better, she hopes to help others in the process. She and her husband Greg have written a book, Painfully Shy, which gives patients information on how to cope with the disorder. Greg is like the best thing that's ever happened to me, and um, we are a team. I feel like he's saved my life, and um, getting married to me is kind of symbolic of the loneliness being over. I want people to know that there is hope and that don't give up. I mean, if I had known I was going to meet Greg, you know, when I was a teenager, you know, I would have like, okay, I'll just cruise through the next 10 years. But you don't know that ahead of time. And I mean, there's so many times where I thought, okay, I want to kill myself because I'm so miserable. And what if I had? I wouldn't have met Greg or I wouldn't have had Jesse. One of the things that strikes me is that there's all this lost potential in a group of people who tend to be our most sensitive and often our most caring. So it's like those are the people we need to get out. No two paths to recovery are the same. Each patient must find his or her own way to overcome anxiety and fear. I feel pretty good, actually. But for those who have spent their lives being afraid of people, there's no greater feeling than knowing you don't have to feel afraid anymore. Yeah. 
I suffered from social anxiety disorder for quite a few years. And since my treatment, since I'm able to alleviate that problem from my life, life is so much more enjoyable now. You don't have to worry about what people are saying about you. You don't have to worry about what people are thinking. You don't have to second guess what you're going to say or do in public and think somebody's going to laugh at you because you can just be yourself and enjoy life. May is Mental Health Month, and you can receive a free screening on National Anxiety Disorders Screening Day. For more information, call toll-free 888-442-2022. This program was brought to you by Freedom From Fear, a nonprofit organization dedicated to helping people who suffer from anxieties and depression.